I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Robert S. Spalding III, Brigadier General, U.S. Air Force, retired. He has served in senior positions of strategy and diplomacy within the Defense and State Departments for more than 26 years, retiring as a Brigadier General. He notably was the CUS Senior Defense Official and Defense Attaché in China in Beijing from the years 2016 to 2017 and Senior Director for Strategic Planning at the National Security Council for, of the White House between 2017 and 2018. Dr. Spalding has an extensive academic background, including a Bachelor of Science degree, Master's of Science degree in Agricultural Business from Fresno State, a PhD in Economics and Mathematics from the University of Missouri, and a second Master's of Science in Strategic Studies from Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. He speaks Mandarin and Spanish. Welcome, General. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, what motivated you to write the book, War Without Rules? Obviously, it was mentioned in Stealth War, and I just thought it would be better for people to hear from the Chinese in their own words, uh, since there, you know, was skepticism with regard to what I had what I had written down in Stealth War, and I thought bringing some of the um, what I used as material source material for Stealth War, and letting people just read the words for themselves, but read it in a way that. Um, didn't put end up putting him to sleep because it was a uh, you know still unrestricted warfare is pretty pretty dense and tough to read. So um, the idea was to give them access to how the Chinese think about uh, warfare in their context, and you know just let it hear let them hear it in the, in the Chinese own words. And when did you first come across unrestricted warfare, and what impression did it make upon you initially? So I first read it back in 1999 when it um, came out uh, and it had been translated by um, the open source folks over at uh, at CIA, and it was um, it was interesting but kind of weird and um, really didn't make a lot of sense. Certainly, um, I didn't have you know any of the any of the background or context that you have today with regard to how the world has changed, you know, you from globalization, and the internet, but they were, you know, blending all these things together. So at the time I just discounted, first of all, I didn't think we we're going to go to war with China. Second of all, I, um, I didn't think of war in the way that unrestricted warfare, um, uh, was portraying it. Mm. Um, from your uh, review of unrestricted warfare, uh, can you explain what Chinese strategies have surfaced that have been most concerning to the security of the United States and the West? Yeah, and I think it's important to note that unrestricted warfare, um, it has, it's been described as a strategy document, and others say, well, the Chinese don't really have a strategy. Um, if you study warfare, what it is is a doctrine document. It's not a strategy document. It, it basically lays out principles in this uh, in this way of war that they that they think about, and um, and it uh, creates um, these you know principles of leveraging the day to day you know people that that people experience in their everyday lives um, for political warfare, and so. It's a, it's an entirely different concept that um, that uh, you know we don't currently resonate with. You know we think of war a distinction between peacetime and wartime, and um, there is no distinction in unrestricted warfare. There is a continuum of war that goes um, mostly from you know non kinetic, uh, but also at times kinetic. And um, it never stops. It doesn't. It doesn't cease. You you don't transition from wartime to peacetime. You basically find yourself, at least you know in their uh, sense, in this continuous competitive environment that that requires that you struggle to achieve, you know, supremacy over your opponent. Has this uh, initiative that you uh, you're in your book uh, has this gained some sort of gravitas within the American political system? I don't think so yet. I mean, I still think that, you know, at least in the United States, when people think of national security, and particularly in the case of information technology, which is one of the technologies, the main technology that they were talking about as being transform uh, transformational for warfare, we look at those things very much like uh, Christian Bros lays out in his book, The Kill Chain. You know, 
information technologies really um, can be useful to help us become more efficient and effective on a battlefield where using force is your ultimate objective to achieve an outcome. And uh, and that's not the way that, that, that these guys think about that. So in, in many ways, w- what Christian Bros brought forth in the kill chain was this idea, hey, you know, innovation, at least in, in the Silicon Valley sense, never made it onto the battlefield. And if it had, if it could make it on the battlefield, we'd be much more effective at killing and blowing things up. What the, the two PLA kernels write is that information technology that Christian Bros is talking about, um, actually, if it is used in the context that the Americans, you know, uh, you know, employ it in warfare, great, but you know, ultimately it's going to end up bankrupting the United States because mm-hmm. pursuing this path of warfare is in, in in essence what the Soviets did during the, the first Cold War. And that in, instead you ought to mix it with economics and finance and really use it uh, in the context that the Chinese uh, have subsequently used it. And that is to begin to influence the perceptions, the behaviors, the intentions of people, not just within your own society, but outside your borders in ways that get them to accept your interests. Mm. And, um, you know, good example of this is just how they've, um, you know, essentially co-opted Hollywood. So Hollywood, you know, rather than representing the principles of the United States, now represent the prim- principles of China because they have influenced the economic behaviors and by virtue of the fact that, you know, most of Hollywood wants their films to be shown in China, influence yeah. how those movies uh, turn out. And so in, a, in essence, they've taken what we've built and then we, they've you know created their own identity and narrative that overlays on top of that and from a business and financial perspective. And they've completely just ignored the military, you know, in terms of the way that we're thinking about it. Now they invested in the military, but that is not their primary objective in terms of how they use warfare. It's about using the everyday to achieve, you know, a, a recognition of your interests. Well, some analysts have argued that uh, the non-kinetic strategies that are outlined in the book Unrestricted Warfare have been aggressively pursued and um, been ongoing for over 20 years. In your opinion, have we been in a newly defined war with China since 1999? We have. And that was, you know, that came really, you know, uh, became very evident to me when I got to the Pentagon um, working for the chairman. And as we were starting to work on the illegal islands in the South China Sea, I had, you know, the prior year spent a year in in New York um, at the Council on Foreign Relations and met a lot of business people. And so it was those uh, uh, interactions and that network that I used to really begin to understand that, you know, while we were thinking of the mil- of the of the China competition in a more kinetic sense, in a more military sense, you know, the Chinese were pursuing this other um, this other um, methodology. And so, I started along with a the team there at the Pentagon to begin studying this in 2014, and. You know, this leads, you know, from 2014 all the way to I get to the White House in 2017 to the development of a national security strategy that's focused on um, the the implications of our relationship with China, not so much in a military sense, although that's part of it, but more in the economic, financial, political sense that um, that unrestricted warfare reveals. And so, um, you know, I don't. I don't see that we have, you know, as a national security um, establishment in the United States, fully embrace that um, that concept. Is it getting traction, though? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I I, I want to say that I believe so in that um, you're hearing more about it. Um, and people are talking more about it, and I think it's become more uh, common in our lexicon, at least understanding that China, there are things that China is doing. I think, though, um, the problem we have from an implementation – so let's say we have a recognition, but from an implementa- implementation standpoint, 
the corporate sector, the U.S. corporate sector has enormous influence over the political process. <laughs> and as a result, because the political process in Washington, D.C., you know, has to be the ones that implement policy that begins to protect the nation from this kind of um, infiltration and influence, as the corporate sector is itself um, influenced by the Chinese Communist Party, therefore they are also influencing our political process. And so in a way, we're captured by this you know, uh, relationship that we've created for you know ostensibly good purposes, but in reality, it ends up backfiring. A good example is the CHIPS Act that was recently passed. So, you know, the idea is let's rebuild our chip industrial base in the United States. The problem is that bill, so $46 billion coming from taxpayers' money into the semiconductor industry in the United States. That semiconductor industry in turn lobbied the Congress to include in that bill the ability for them to invest their money in China. So oh US government investing you know, taxpayer money in the United States, and therefore, since the, the companies don't have to invest that money, their money, they can invest it in China, that's what they negotiated in this bill. So that's what I mean where the Chinese Communist Party is able to influence our oh. corporate sector to begin to dismantle any protections that are sought in Washington, D.C. It's the same thing at the White House. You have the National Security Council saying this economic relationship with China is a national security problem for us. Uh, taking the National Economic Council says you are wrong. That is only a business thing. It is not a national security thing, and you are incorrectly applying. You're you're going beyond your mandate, National Security Council, in calling out this relationship. Well, taking that as a cue, uh, as China has done much to attract global investments, particularly those from the United States and the West, it begs the question: Should there be a national security interest in the free market system? Well, there is, and in fact. You go back to World War II, we nationalized the rubber industry. We nationalized the steel industry. We told you know, Ford to start making airplanes. We, we, we transformed our industrial base into a defense industrial base, an arsenal for America, if you will, that enabled us to fight the Nazis. So to, to take industrial policy and say that that is not – that's completely divorced from national security just belies everything that we know about history – and today, you know, as an example, it's incredibly uh, potent uh, for our independence and sovereignty. For example, um, let's say, you know, as Pelosi goes to Taiwan and, and you know, this starts a, a series of confrontations with the United States that leads to the U.S. imposing sanctions because of some, you know, action that China, that China takes. It is in the realm of possibility that the Chinese then come back and say, we are going to restrict the flow of pharmaceuticals to the United States as a result of this. We have no option. We don't make our own antibiotics. 90% of our pharmaceuticals come from China. So we have in, in, in moving our industrial base in the China and not having an industrial policy that recognizes that we must, you know, look at this uh, from a perspective of national security. We've created the ability for the Chinese to coerce us using the fact that we can't make our own uh, pharmaceuticals. That is just one example um, of the many things that come from China that they can use to against us. Hmm. Oh, I've been uh, quite concerned about uh, the sort of political penetration, not only of the United States and Canada, but also uh, Great Britain and the West. Uh, one of the venues for that is a Confucius Institute, which appears to have penetrated Western edu educational uh, systems, particularly at the university and postgraduate level, which in turn receives large amounts of money to pursue you know, China, the Chinese uh, studies, including Mandarin. Uh, do you really see this as a threat uh, to the United States and the West? 
Well, it is, and it's not always obvious how it is. So, you know, Confucius Institutes, for example, become, um, you know, essentially centers of the Chinese narrative, the Chinese Communist Party narrative within the university system. But the money going into the universities also has begun to impact policies. And, you know, the best example that I can give of this is the Imperial College of London and their um, epidemiology models that were saying that, you know, so many millions of Americans were going to die as a result of the coronavirus. The Imperial College of London receives tens of millions of dollars of money from the Chinese Communist Party, as do other universities. Not only that, uh, but if you look at the endowments of uh, university systems like Harvard, for example, there's a lot of Chinese money in the endowments. And so, you know, if you look at academia as a, you know, as one of the, the pillars of the West, if you will, one of the things that um, it was built on is this idea of, um, of truth, of the search mm -hmm. of truth and the ability to have uh, dialogue. As you've seen on university campuses, the ability to have um, realistic dialogue where you can discuss many sides of an issue, that has literally just gone away. It is not um, without a, 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 um, a, play, a role to play of the Chinese Communist Party and the United Front Work Group, who funds the Chinese uh, Confucius Institutes on university campuses to promote that kind of um, that uh, a kind of effect. It also happens in academic, in peer-reviewed academic journals. Why? Because most of the uh, articles that are that are appearing in peer-reviewed academic journals today are produced by Chinese scholars. And what we found in those is widespread uh, falsification of data, fabrication. And so there is many elements to how the Chinese Communist Party and their integration in the West is leading to the downfall of academia mm -hmm. as an institution of the West that promotes this um, search for truth that was a feature of the Enlightenment period. So it's almost like what you've seen is as China has entered the global stage and entered these institutions, a lot of the things that we kind of take for granted as coming having come from the Enlightenment period and have led to you know widespread you know growth and in, in in uh prosperity and health, you've seen actually a reversal of those things. And it's not um it's not just because of our own failings as a society. It's also because the Chinese Communist Party has a defined interest to make sure that we they unseat and undermine the pillars of the West that um, that allows them then to begin to implement implement their own um, you know their own patterns of belief as it applies to the global international order so liberal democratic order is something that they seek to undermine one of the pillars of that order is western academic institutions so let's undermine the idea of you know the way western academic institutions at least were conceived and then over time as they become not you know purveyors of truth but purveyors of a narrative that is essentially the irrefutability is taken out of it. You cannot refute the narrative because you're not allowed to. That becomes a part and parcel of the international order. So, so we're not, they're not destroying the order. What they're, what they're doing is slowly taking it over by taking out the principles that underpin that order. Hmm. Well, in your book, you acknowledge the importance of knowing your enemy and understanding the spectrum of military and non-military machinations, which the Chinese appear to be conducting on a broad scale. What can be done to inform our political, economic, and bureaucratic elites, as well as the layperson, as to this insidious, multifarious uh, threat? Well, you know, my my contribution to that is stealth war and, and war without rules. But Absolutely. I think we have to be comfortable uh, being critical. And we have to be comfortable um, 
questioning. We we must also uh, always question policies, you know, regulations, you know, um, the prevailing narrative, and say, okay, you know, what is what is behind this? Who is behind it? What are their uh, motives and intentions? And is could there be, you know, m- not necessarily nefarious, but certainly financial incentive to you know drive you know this a certain way um you know i talk about uh, a lot in war without rules is uh, uh, about how the coronavirus was used as an opportunity by the chinese communist party to um, essentially for their own interests that that na- that narrative around the coronavirus if you remember, um, and, and still is, over the last two years, was very um, well and methodically controlled in terms of who could speak mm-hmm. and what they could say and what they could talk about. And it is really hard for people to recognize that nearly all the policy decisions from a, from a medical policy perspective came from, originated from China. And that is something that has to be questions, questioned. Part of the problem is that because we are so invested from a political perspective in the narratives surrounding the coronavirus, and this is the power of unrestricted warfare, it becomes very hard to question our own system because you know, in many ways we did it to ourselves, but we did it because we were led down the primrose path by a uh, a system, the Chinese Communist Party system, that had an incentive to drive that a certain direction, and you, we have to question ourselves in order to question that. Um, I one of my interests is that we see so many uh, university students in the West are from China. Uh, they come here, they learn uh, the latest technology, they understand our, our culture, our language. Yet we do not have the same amount of exchange with China. Do you see this as a strategic issue in the future? Oh, it's a strategic issue today. So, for example, um, a Chinese student will come to the United States. They will bring all of their social media with them. Uh So it's not like, um, you know, in the past when you left the borders of China and you came and enmeshed yourself in uh, American society, you know, culturally, you had to be, you had to begin to intermingle. Because they bring their social media with them, they, in, in essence, bring a piece of China with them. And so they're able to um, stay uh, connected and use these social media apps that are very much censored by the Chinese Communist Party. So, you know, they're not getting the full kind of effect of america because in they they often the 80 percent of the time they'll speak chinese to only intermingle with other chinese students and then they'll stay um uh, on um chinese social media platforms that is how so creating the great firewall was step one step two was and that great firewall prevents any of our social media platforms from making their way into china Step two is to control the Chinese social media platforms. When they move out into other places like free societies, they are they're still within a digital bubble that essentially protects the, the Chinese Communist Party can control and protect and censor. And so not having that the ability to first of all, allowing those social media apps to be in the United States without having reciprocity reciprocity in China means that the Chinese are able to have their narrative for those Chinese students outside their borders, but Chinese uh, American students or Chinese students in China are not allowed to afford the same opportunity with regard to Western media. And now that um, is not so much a problem today because what we've seen is Western media um, is in itself has been kind of captured by this um, one global narrative. Uh, part of the problem is, and, there, and there's a good example of this, you know, um, 
person that's on the um, board of Pfizer is also on the board of Thomson Reuters. Mm. So you're having an intermingling of the major media organizations within the West and the corporations of the West and the fact that the Chinese Communist Party has money invested in those organizations. So you have maybe five um, major uh, organizations for media in the United States. Those are all corporate. Those shares are owned in addition by the Chinese Communist Party. So there has been a homogenization of the narrative as a result, not of, you know, Pfizer becoming a Chinese company or Thomson Reuters becoming a Chinese company, Mm -hmm. but by virtue of the fact. So before China was part of that, it's what America did with its corporate sector. It went out and kind of it spread democracy and it spread it because ultimately American corporations had, you know, fealty to the U.S., Today, they're multinational corporations, and because they're multinational, they have really no fealty to any one government. But China uses that that ability to influence that system to say, and they understand it much more so than we do in a way that says, hey, I can financially control these entities by getting in, involved from a business sense in their in their relations. We don't do that in the West. There's a complete separation between the government and private sector. And so because all of these media, uh, all these major media have become corporatized and because that corporation, it's 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 intermingled, like, for instance, Blackstone Mm -hmm. owns um, owns, um, you know, enormous shares in all of these corporations. So you could you could almost say that, you know, as Blackstone goes, so does corporate America. Well, as the Chinese Communist Party goes, so does Blackstone. So you have created this ability to influence what was once an American institution. So we talked about academia. Now we're talking about the corporate sector. That has been totally pulled into the Chinese Communist Party's orbit because of this uh, this ability to kind of intermingle uh, financial um, relationships. Do you see within the American corporate leadership and the political leadership any sort of uh, initiative to counter this, understanding the complexities and the potential threat that it uh, poses not only to the United States but the West? No, quite the opposite. In fact, the corporate sector is completely comfortable saying, hey, we, we there should be a sh- separation of church and state, right? There should be a separation between my private company and the government. Well, the Chinese Communist Party doesn't doesn't play by those rules. And so um, a good example of this argument, how it how it kind of backfires is Google. You know, Google doesn't want to uh, support the U.S. military with artificial intelligence, but they do want to support China and and commercial companies in China uh, with artificial intelligence. But the Chinese say that if you have artificial intelligence in a in a commercial company in China, that technology must, by law, be given to the military. And so, you know, the civil military fusion ensures that whatever goes to the corporate sector in China goes to the military. And so, we we are, you know, what we believe taking the high road, and we're creating this separation between corporate and government. China doesn't play that game, and so they get the benefits of Google. That you know, their military gets the benefits of Google, and their political structure gets the benefits of Google. But in America, those that technology can't be used to promote democracy, or rule of law, or civil liberties, or human rights, because that's what we would do in the West. Instead, those technologies developed by Google, you know, now are allowed to support the opposite. And so, you know. It's it's ironic that Google's do no harm actually is doing harm because they are essentially incentivized by the Chinese Communist Party to do so. And because we have a separation between the corporate sector and the government here in the United States, the government is like it doesn't have the tools to get in and and really do anything about that. And so it's kind of left on the sidelines while – China is able to kind of um, orchestrate the outcomes that they want. 
Well, in your time with the National Security Council uh, and advising the White House, what was the stand of, let's say, the CIA, the FBI on on these issues? Well, the, and so as I um, – and this really stemmed from my time in the Pentagon. As I started to question you know, these things within the intelligence community, there was a lot of pushback. Mm. Uh, and the pushback basically said the, the the Chinese are not an enemy. They're they're not an adversary. And I think that comes from as you take a step back and say why why have we uh, kind of um, clipped our wings when it comes to recognizing you know this totalitarian state that you know hates uh, everything we stand for, not as an adversary. And it really comes from the political system. So. Whether it be the President George H. W. Bush or Clinton or George W. Bush or Obama, any of the presidents that have that have um, served since uh, Tiananmen Square, for example, mm -hmm. the, you know the idea has been if we just you know bring China into the fold, they will they will liberalize, and that was such a powerful belief. By both on the part of both the right and the left, that it motivated our uh, national security policy and foreign policy to such an extent that the um, the intelligence community just shut off, you know, just shut off their switch in terms of thinking about China as an adversary, and you couldn't get that switch turned on. In fact, they they um, you know. I remember sitting in um, in a meeting with all you know all of the the NIMS and the NIOs you know um, you know whether it had to do with China or economic you know they 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 they're they're separated by regional and functional uh, designations um, they're just just absolutely incredulous that China could be viewed as an adversary. And in particular, uh, you know that that economics could be a problem, and so um, you know when you when you kind of look at the, the national security um, architecture, you know the, the the enterprise, if you will, it is very much influenced by politics and politics and on the right and the left. This is something that people don't really recognize: <laughs> foreign policy, national security policy. There is a consensus. There's a bipartisan consensus that exists, and in the in the in in the case of China, the bipartisan consensus that existed is there's nothing to see here. In fact, anybody that says there's something to see here obviously doesn't understand it. You know, they don't understand China, and therefore, you know, we should basically suppress whatever they have to say. That was the feature when I started this, and so um, I think you know getting us to question that and the intelligence community in particular has been very hard and the only, the way that that's been able to kind of open up here in the um in lately is that a lot of those people have left and i think what we need here in the united states is people that are willing to question you know why we do things and in particular you know war without rules is trying to describe here's a different way of looking at the world. And here is a different way of looking at warfare. Here's a different way of thinking about how you to protect your uh, political independence and sovereignty. And, and it, for me, the process of taking a step back, criticizing the way I thought, you know, in my own internal biases that were themselves created in this, um, in, in my professional military education, in my entire military career, my time as a military diplomat, my time as, you know, um, at the Pentagon, and being able to question, hey, maybe I have some, you know, biases that were created because I grew up in this system mm -hmm. that I need to peel away and begin to critically evaluate the way I think about the world and in doing so, begin to to move out. And I think that's where I think you're starting to see that in the intelligence community. But the problem is it's you're seeing it at the lower levels. Yeah. The upper levels are still controlled, you know, by uh, predominantly those same people that came up in the world. And they they, for whatever reason, have a ref they're refusing to to question their own biases. We are one of the things that that I'm sure you're very aware of is the fact that we can't call China a peer. You know, the closest we can call them is a near peer, mm -hmm. even though 
we have to acknowledge they have the predominance of military power in the Indo-Pacific, we still have a hard time saying they're a peer adversary because there's this belief in our own system that America has no peer, that we are predominant. And, you know, I, I think that's one of the – just one example of how we are having a hard time, and the intelligence community is not immune to basically questioning, you know, what our beliefs are, how they're, how they're maybe perhaps biased, and then how do we – unpack that and begin to really take a a, um, a real uh, you know uh, critical view of the way we think about national security uh taking from that uh i get the impression now that we've got cognitive dissidents at the highest levels and not only in the the uh, political realm, but also in the economic uh, with our, uh, our business uh, communities on a not only a national and international but on a global scale as to this threat how do we deal with that? Is it time to, uh, is a wake up call coming? Uh, is, is what we see uh, China's aggression uh, in the, the Pacific area, the rim and its threatening behavior? Uh, should that be a wake up call for a lot of people? I know the, in the UK, uh, the, it's much discussion as to whoever leads the Conservative Party, indeed the British government is going to have to uh, look at the threat of China in the, in the near run. Your view, sir. So um, I think, you know, just going back to the Cold War, we, we had had World War I, we had World War II, um, you know, and then we had the Cold War. We had people that had come through the crucible of those two great wars and had a sense of um, how hard uh, preserving liberty was. Um, people like Churchill, um, FDR was pretty critical in, in World War II in terms of he had, he got a lot of pushback from the corporate sector on, you know, uh, you know, he believed that we had to confront, you know, Nazi Germany. And then and then through the Cold War, you had people that had lived through World War II, understood the implications of backing down to um, you know, the not the Nazis um throughout the late 1930s and saw the need and 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 Churchill came to America and he went to St. Louis and gave his Iron Curtain speech. And so my sense is what's happened is the Cold War ended. Um, as uh, as empires do, not with a bang, but with a whimper. And um, everybody just kind of went about their business and nobody thought that we should continue to, to think strategically about how we preserve the republic in a world where America is not um, the predominant power and in a world where, in fact, you have um, – you know, a major power like China that really thinks in the opposite direction of the course of history. And so, um, you know, how do you, how do you change that? I, my, my gut tells me, and um, this is, a, this is a tragic way to think about the problem, but my gut tells me is that we're not prepared for the actions that Russia took uh, in invading Ukraine, and I don't think we're we're prepared for the actions that China will take in invading Taiwan, and that maybe um, uh, therein lies the catalyst of our um, of our of our awakening from our slumber. That that kind of a threat to the international order um, that is more consistent with what we view war um, may be the thing that helps us wake up to it. But I think if 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 I'm Xi Jinping and I just continue to run the tables the way I have been running and I don't succumb to my own uh, hubris, that's um, then I don't move on Taiwan. And therefore, you know, over time, you know, the the things that we stand for just ce cease to have any relevance in the world. I think that, you know, how we this ends is that China can't. Um, escape its own hubris. It is victim to um, the same hubris that Putin has demonstrated by invading Ukraine. Can't help it. And therein perhaps lies our salvation. So it strikes me, if, at least from our discussion so far, is that we have a real problem with elite capture. 
within uh, the uh, Western governments uh, writ large, not just the United States, not Canada, but, but the Western governments writ large. How do we address that? It's very difficult because um, there is a relationship between the people that are getting very wealthy uh, in politics and the people that are getting well, very wealthy in business and the, who, they're, who they're working with to get very wealthy. And you know, like the FBI is, is, is happy to tell you, most of this stuff isn't illegal. It's not illegal. It's not illegal. And that's what the, what the Chinese Communist Party recognized. You know, the, 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 it's almost, if you think about it and you go back and you look at the Soviet Union, they spent themselves into bankruptcy and the Chinese look at that and they're like, why would you do that? Why, <laughs> why? If they're gonna let, if the Americans are gonna let you buy them off, and oh, by the way, if you look throughout Chinese military history, they have a long history of buying off their adversaries, not necessarily fighting them. They're not very good at fighting, but they are very good at you know um, uh, basically subsuming through um, through through greed. Why not do that? And so I think um, you can't. Uh, people are motivated by money, and to the extent that there's no. Um, there's nothing illegal about them doing business with a Chinese company, and that Chinese company, you know, is influenced by the the um, interests of the Chinese Communist Party. Then basically, you have no defense. There, you, there, you're not breaking a law. You're 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 getting rich, and into in 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 today's morality, getting rich is really. Mm -hmm demonstrating that you are a good person, that you are doing things the right way, um, particularly if you're not breaking any laws. And so, you know, it has to be somebody with the political courage to stand up and say, and the ability to um, get elected, because part of the problem with our politics today is, you know, the, the, the donations are going to politicians that are supporting this uh, activity. Um, I mean, you just look at Pelosi. She's she's got hundreds of millions of dollars, and she um, she has supported these companies, and in fact, profited from these companies. And it's the same on the on the uh, political right. And so we have a system today that it doesn't. These things aren't illegal. You know, a good example of another good example of kind of um, you know this is um, Mitch McConnell's sister-in-law, who's on the board of the people's bank of china like you know if i if my uh, sister-in-law was on the pe pe bank of the people's uh, board of the people's uh, bank of china yeah i wouldn't have been able to have a security clearance but this is prevalent throughout our political system and so um you know it I, I don't know what else to say. Like I've called it out. Uh, peter schweitzer calls it out um you know in his book um caught red handed. I mean, it's just, it's there. It's, it's, it's wide open for everybody to see. And if you rose your right hand to uh, swear an oath to the constitution and you, you look at, you're confronted with this, what do you say about it? I mean, there's, it's very, very difficult to, um, to, 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 to digest. Uh, it's interesting to note that something is so banal as TikTok has enabled China to access U.S. data. How can this technology, technological data accumulated in China be weaponized, in your view? Oh, there's a lot of ways. First of all, um, uh, data collected on your smartphone uh, can be used to track you. Um, and then that tracking can be turned into targeted ads that go to your device. Um, and then, you know, just the algorithm with algorithms within TikTok, basically what they're doing is they're taking what they learn uh, from you and returning videos that, you know, appeal to you. Well, in those videos that appeal to you can also be messages that, um, that appeal to you as well. And there's been many um, examples, you know, one of the uh, people that I talk about a lot that that shows this is a YouTuber named Lao Y86, uh, who uh, lived in China, married a Chinese wife, eventually had to flee China um, because they were after him. 
you know, shows that these there there are, you know, propaganda videos within TikTok. And because they're made by different people at different places and different times, um, they, you know, they're made to appeal to a broad audience. But, you know, that one message is read off a script by all of those um, people that are uh, reading the script. So it's a way to target a message to a person in a way that, you know, the system knows that you that will appeal to you. But then the message is the same, right? China's good. The U.S. is bad. <laughs> it's, it, so there's a lot of ways that your device can be used. You know, that data can be used against you. In, in many ways, data collected about you is the most potent um, uh, resource for uh, military attack that's ever been devised. You know, I'm an airman. I, I, I was trained to drop bombs on buildings and, you know, hardened aircraft shelters and runways. You know, having being uh, the type of airman that has the ability to go and change the, the um, intentions or perceptions of a person, that's power. Mm -hmm. That is really um, not unprecedented in the history of warfare. You haven't been able to go to individuals and say, I'm going to change the way you think about something. That that changes war because now you're not having to fight through that um, using force. You're actually slowly bringing them over to your side. You, you're not, you're not in, you're not having to coerce them into, to doing to a geopolitical outcome. You're swaying them over to your side so that now the things that they believe once believed are no longer the case. And so data, in my opinion, and this is why Kai-Fu Lee uh, says that China is going to become the Saudi Arabia of data. Data is really the, you know, it's 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 like um, unprocessed uranium ore, right? You, you take the ore, you sift it, you sift it, you sift it, you sift it, sift it, and finally you get um, highly enriched uranium, uh, weapons grade uranium. Data is the same thing for artificial intelligence. And it's it's about taking that data and sifting, 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 sifting until you have the ability to influence the decisions of a person that is so powerful. It's way more powerful than nuclear weapons because nuclear weapons are very destructive, but artificial intelligence can be very um, advantageous in a way that you don't, you don't have to fight. You don't have to spend your money. And, and, and more importantly, TikTok's a, you know, a highly valuable company, so you can make money at the same time. That's, I mean, look, I um, I'm constantly amazed by the brilliance <laughs> of the Chinese Communist Party because, you know, we we invented the technology. Like they didn't invent the internet, and in you know, TikTok just took advantage of stuff that we made, and they and 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 the Chinese Communist Party has taken advantage of these technologies in ways, and that's what. War Without Rules describes mm -hmm. what they're saying about unrestricted warfare. The thing that that really um, amazes me is here I was, um, you know, a young captain flying B-52s. You know, I, I, I could get on the Internet. I could see all these things. <laughs> I couldn't see the implications for warfare, though. Mm -hmm. It would take somebody schooled in political warfare sure. to see the impl implications of it. Um, we don't teach Machiavelli at the war colleges. Mm. We, we teach Sun Tzu, we teach Clausewitz, we teach Jomini or Duhet. We don't teach <laughs> Machiavelli. If we taught Machiavelli, then I think we would be, be better um, positioned to understand what these two PLA colonels are saying. Mm. It's interesting, uh, as a graduate of the U.S. Army War College, I, I was always amazed at, well, the facet of, of military technology and power. And lots of ships at sea, air dominance, ground dominance, new technology. But when I, can, I always would uh, offer, at least uh, uh, to my fellow classmates, is uh, without economic security, you have no national security. Is this ever going to penetrate the hardcore minds within the Pentagon and our Western military establishments? No, I, I think um, I think unless you know, one of the things that, that we ought to do is change 
professional military education and really take a step back and say, make these uh, young officers and, um, and, 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 and future leaders much more understanding of what else is going on. Look, they are already becoming, you know, good at combat. What they need to become good at is politics and economics and philosophy. And I think we probably, you know, in earlier um, uh, days of our republic, did a better job of that. We don't do a good job of it, of it anymore. We don't, you know, we don't study philosophy or um, or economics or politics at the war colleges. And I think we should because, you know, when you when you look at unrestricted warfare, that, that's what they're talking about. Like they are so much better educated. Um, as thinkers than the average military officer uh, in the United States. We're so focused at the tactical level in terms of how do we employ combat power and not why do we employ yeah. combat power. Um, and, 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 and that is an important question that that ought to be one that we explore at professional military education. So it's almost like you need to take a step back from war and really study the context that war exists within mm -hmm. as you know as you progress up the ranks and you become i think probably um one of the most i think prescient thinkers on you know the the military in our time is eisenhower mm -hmm. eisenhower recognized you know why in 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 the reasons for war and recognizes recognize the interplay between politics and economics and the military and um and i think he set the 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 stage for how we were going to confront the soviet union but he had he had um i think he had a, a much better grasp on all of these different um things that come together for a national leader than um, than we've ever had. I think maybe Reagan uh, was, but he, but Reagan was also a child of World War II. So was Kennedy. Um, and, you know, he, so I think you had, again, people that, that were, that went beyond uh, kind of, um, you know, just where we are today as, and the military class, Military officers, they're the ones that are kind of tasked with protecting the our democracy. But I under, un, unfortunately, they, they've kind of lost sight of the fact what our de democracy is or how it might be changing as a result of these things. And so um, I think professional military education is one way that we could um, reclaim some of that intellectual high ground that would allow us to um, – to 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 confront these um, these issues. What you've been uh, the thread that I get from our discussion is that there's a whole of government approach that is missing to counter the Chinese communist uh, threat. Is there a way or a venue within the United States government or within NATO that we can basically uh, task this as a a function uh, to address this threat? On a global scale, absolutely. But you can't take it um, piecemeal. Um, and I think you know one of the things that um, that I thought Eisenhower did a good job was was analyzing. And he had you know he uh, had Project Solarium where they came in and looked at you know all aspects of our strategy. Mm -hmm. um, this is much. Uh, what's required is as much an internal look uh, into our own system as it is at looking at the adversary. And I think, um, you know, back then, back when we were doing the Cold War, you know, Churchill was still kind of highly regarded here in the United States. And he could come to St. Louis and say, we've got a collective problem. We don't have politicians of the stature of a Churchill or an Eisenhower anymore. We, we don't have this um, shared suffering that we went through into, you know, it's, it's almost we've had shared success. And share and success does not breed no. people that are um, hardy of character and and will, and um, and so, uh, you know, uh, I struggle with trying to you know figure out 
how do we get people to um I think I feel like, and this is this is something terrible to say. I feel like we have to go through a crucible of struggle before we can emerge and have people with the character that can and the credibility that can stand up and say these are the types of things that we need to do. These are, um, and so, and then that there is um, that shared suffering across the Atlantic, you know, and, and throughout Asia, where we can come together. Um, with allies and say, okay, we recognize that we have to um, we have to change things. I, I just um, it doesn't bode well that we have you know 240 plus years of history as a republic, and we're nearing the point where you know two to three hundred years where um, where empires fall. Not to say the United States is an empire, but certainly you could say that Western civilization. Um, could be considered an empire, and maybe Western civilization has to fall, and maybe we have to fall into these dark times of tyranny, and then you know to emerge. But what will emerge will be something different. And so, um, this is a thing that I fear. Um, you know, and I, if I, if I had the magic, um, the magic button to to push to to wake everybody up and say, hey, we can do it before we fall into that trap. I think it would be one thing, but I don't. I don't see it absent. As I said, the Chinese moving on Taiwan and really kind of awakening this recognition that we need to protect ourselves. But that's a much more um, that's a much more traditional threat that I think we can get our wrap our minds around. What we're talking about with unrestricted warfare and war without rules is the everyday that is you know ostensibly there to help you is actually trying to kill you. Mm -hmm. well, it's interesting that uh, such banal inroads, supposedly, are uh, could be the death knell of uh, Western civilization. Well, yeah, and, there, and there's always these um, stories of um, you know tragedies where um, somebody uh, thinks that they're they're caring for a loved one, but they're slowly feeding them poison, and over <laughs> time, you know, the, the the person dies. And I think in this case. You know, we um, we think that you know somebody coming and bearing gifts is somebody friendly, and, ra and 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 rather those gifts are designed to undermine the fabric of our society, and that's really hard to see. It's really hard for people to to recognize, and um, and it takes a discerning, critical citizenry to um, to question their leaders and say, you know, something doesn't seem right here. And, and why are we doing this? And why are we doing that? And especially today, where if you do question where the world is going, then you get called a heretic or, you know, a crazy and you're, you're, you're cut off, you're canceled from having a discussion. So I don't know. I mean, this is the, I see um, if, if I could not see a better strategy to undermine and destroy our republic than um, unrestricted, and it's not a strategy, but a doctrine, a, a better doctrine to undermine our society than un unrestricted warfare. I think it is perfectly made for our time in history. It's perfectly made for the technology of the 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 age, and I think um, I think it's so perfect that um, absent us, you know, something happening that is out of character for that doctrine, um, we're going to succumb to it because, you know, there's no way for us to, to really um, waken up from it. General, uh, on that note, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I, do, I do recommend uh, the audience uh, read your book and your books. Uh, War Without Rules and Stealth War, which I found uh, from an academic point of view most enlightening. And uh, I wish you all the best in your future endeavors, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your service, sir.